Well, if y'all can hear us now, that's great. We'll start over. We've been asked to do a short uh, in-service for your staff on some of the multi-drug resistant organisms that are currently a problem in long-term long care facilities, specifically yours. Um, and you're not alone in that. There's quite a few. So who you have with you today is your CAPSID consulting team. We're, we're your infectious disease consultants. I'm a nurse with CPHQ Healthcare Quality Management and CIC, Infection Prevention Certifications, Dr. Ramsey Asfor, Dr. Dose Sarpel. Um, and that's your CAPSID team. And many of you know us anyway from asking us questions over the past. But um, today we're going to do a very brief look at MDROs and enhanced standard precautions. And we're here to answer your questions. So we'll try and keep the presentation piece as, as brief as we can so that we have time for your questions. And know that even after this is done, we're here to answer your questions. Just bring them on and we'll do everything we can to support you in this battle that we're in. And uh, thank you for all your hard work. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see this presentation. And I'm gonna leave my little slides open to the side. Now, can y'all see that okay? I know it's gonna be hard from the back of the room. We'll zoom in a little bit and see if that helps, but it makes it a little bit harder to see. You've got, um, we can print this as handouts for you as well, if that's helpful. Um, but let's take a look at C CRPA, CRAB, and CRE. And we're gonna look at the antimicrobial resistance patterns that we're seeing here in California. California has been a problem um, along with other states. California is not alone, but you're a heavily populated state. Um, we're seeing that um, in the United States, 2.8 million illnesses and 35,000 deaths due to resistant organisms in the United States. And in California, with the most recent data, this comes down to about 360,000 illnesses and 4,500 deaths. So that's people dying specifically from some of these multi-drug resistant organisms. Um, the ones that are being targeted are CRE, um, Acinetobacter, Candida auris, which we may talk about in a separate presentation, C. diff, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You've probably heard of all those. Marianne, hit pre hit present on the top top part of your yeah. Hit Ooh, okay. that no no hit that present button. Just yeah. the, the not the yeah that one. Yeah, I know. I like to be able to flip back, but that's okay. Oh, we'll do okay. that. Yeah, is that okay? Got it. Okay, there you go. I'll take that presenter view away. Is that any better? Okay, urgent and serious threats. That's the, the phrase we're using here, urgent and serious threats. There's three steps to this process. If you wanna make it better and make the world a better place, not just in your facility, but your state and your country, prevent the emergence of these, detect them and contain them. Those are the three steps. Preventing emergence, you're already doing a good job at because your facility uh, participates in antibiotic stewardship, which is one of the tasks that CAPSID helps you with. Detecting them often falls to you as nursing staff. You're at the bedside, you know these patients, you see them day to day, you perform the lab results, you're gonna be looking for these. And of course, we'll talk more about that. And of course, containment is what you do each and every day, you work hard at containing these organisms and keeping them from spreading um, to other residents or even to you. So there's quite a few out there. You want to know the acronym Multi-Drug Resistant Organism, MDRO, um, with new ones emerging all the time. You already know a lot about C. diff. Um, and you manage your C. diff quite well in your facility. So we're gonna talk about these others, CRPA, which is the Pseudomonas, CRAB, the Acinetobacter bomani, and CRE, which is a group, um, usually includes Klebsiella, Enterobacter, or E. coli. And you may have seen those pop up on your culture results. Those are the three that we're gonna look at today. So in order to detect it, you have to be able to recognize it. A culture has come back, whether it's on a new admission or one that you did in the facility. You get a culture report, how do we know we have an MDRO? And specifically for the ones we're talking about today, the carbapenem resistant ones. So this is kind of a, it's a piece actually of a, a real culture report, but it's just a part of it. For carbapenem resistant, you're gonna look at your panel 
and look at what's resistant and what's sensitive or susceptible, you'll see on some results. On this one, you can see that it's resistant to meropenem. Meropenem is one of the carbapenem classification drugs. So look for meropenem, emipenem, and ertapenem. You see that phrase penem at the end of each of those words. Those are the three carbapenem drugs that you're going to see in your panels. This one, you can only see the meropenem, but you may see the emipenem and the ertapenem on there as well. It says it's resistant, so we know we've got a problem there. It's resistant to some other things, but right Right now, for carbapenem resistant, this is what we're looking for, the penems. There's more, a lot more on that culture report. Um, now, if, I hate it when it does that. <laughs> That's why I like the other things, so you know, I don't flip so crudely. If it's susceptible or sensitive to one of the penems, let's say it's CRPA, because this is Pseudomonas <clears throat> aeruginosa, that's our C CRPA bug, we won't call it <clears throat> CRPA just yet. We know that it's resistant to one of the penems, but not all of them. It's, re it's resistant to all of them. Okay, then we've got a CRPA, carbapenem resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but we don't know that from this slide. So, and there's one more thing you need to look for. Um, we know that with carbapenem resistance, this bacteria is gonna be harder to treat than many others. And over time, it could, develop that resistance even further and become impossible to treat. We do sometimes see MDROs that have no susceptibility to antibiotics. And that's pretty scary when you think about that. And C. diff, which you're familiar with, is only responsive to a couple of antibiotics. And one of them only works half the time. You all know what those two are? Flagyl and Vanco, right? We don't even use Flagyl in your nursing home anymore because it's not likely to work. The C. diff is up in that category too, but that's not on our list for today. So what could be a bacteria that not only is resistant to antibiotics, but that actually produces enzymes that attack and destroy antibiotics. That's really scary when you think about it. How smart is that bug? Those are called producers. So when you see a lab result, like the page we just looked at before for that pseudomonas, if the lab hasn't already run the testing, it's DNA sequencing to find out whether that organism, that particular bug is actually a producer, um, they will need to do that. So you may get a preliminary result that doesn't tell you yet whether it's a producer or not. And it's a producer of these enzymes. Some CRPA will be a producing strain of the organism and others won't. Same for CRE, um, that's going to be resistant, um, but not necessarily a producer. Here's what you'll see on the rest of that lab result. You'll see the DNA sequencing, and it'll look somewhat like this. This is a sample and it's simplified. We're just looking at a piece but see the DNA sequencing, not detected, not detected, not detected, not detected. It is an MDRO, but those sequences were not detected. So this particular CRPA is not a producer. If it was, one of these, at least one of these would have been detected, depending on the bug that you're looking at. Um, when you get one that is a producer, CDPH needs to be notified um, because you may end up screening your other residents. It might just be the roommate. It may just be people in that hall or that unit. Could be the whole facility. CDPH is going to be your pal on this, and they're going to tell you exactly what they want you to do because they want to know where all of these patients are, each and every one of them. What building are they in? What hospital are they going to? That's something CDPH wants to be involved in because these bugs are dangerous. Do you have any questions so far? Or Dr. Asper and Dr. Sarpel, anything to add in so far? I think you're really covering it. I think that's great. Yeah, I think you're doing a good job. And I, I, I just want to second what you said earlier, just because, you know, because this, this does happen and we do get questions, just because something is resistant to one carbapenem does not automatically make it, you know, car, car, carbapenem resistant organism, um, especially uh, acinetobacter is known uh, to have discordant sensitivities, you know, sometimes it could be intermediate to 
imipenem, but sensitive to miropenem. So uh, it's important not to, you know, get very concerned when you see that and you have to wait for the DNA sequencing. And not all the carbapenems work on pseudomonas. So again, erdapenem, which is in vans, has no pseudomonas coverage. So you can't even consider that as a marker for a resistant organism. So I just wanted to, um, you know, re-emphasize that stuff. That's why it wasn't on that panel that, that we showed. Exactly. But exactly. I just, yeah, I thought I could make but it complicated and show them all. I thought, well, look, right, no, no, exactly. But, you know, we do get, I mean, I've seen physicians start erdapenem for pseudomonas. I mean, it, it definitely happens because people don't uh, remember or realize that, so. Um, yeah. It's really important to know, looking at the DNA sequencing, not, not just carbapenem sensitivities, because it could be discordant. And always ask. When in doubt, ask, by all means. So we don't want them to spread to other residents, of course. You're there to, they're totally dependent on you for their care, but you don't want to bring these home either. You could become colonized with these bugs. And uh, then someday when, when you are stressed or got something else going on or develop a wound, you could become infected with these as well. So we don't want them to spread to anybody anywhere. And that's why you need precautions. And this is everyone's job. All persons that come into contact with these organisms or, or find themselves in situations where they could contact them must take steps to ensure they don't spread. This is something you can't see. Those bugs are living there around that G-tube or that Foley catheter or that pressure ulcer. They're sitting there in their urine, in the stool, but you can't see them. So sometimes it's hard, we understand that, to fight a bug that you can't see. But what are your choices when we've identified that a patient may have one of these end arrows? Well, you can go into your regular transmission-based contact isolation, which is very effective. That means as soon as you step into that room, you cross the threshold, you're gonna be gowned, gloved, masked, whatever's indicated for the bug that's in that room and whatever its route of spreading is. Um, and we all know that's hard. That's hard on everyone. It's hard on you going in and out. It's hard on the patients because they end up feeling isolated. It's difficult all around, but it is effective when you do it right. Um, CDPH and the CDC like to promote a second type of enhanced of precautions called enhanced standard precautions. That's what California calls it, but the CDC calls it enhanced barrier precautions. Same thing, just a different name. And this means we use special steps like gowns or gloves based on the activity and an individualized risk assessment. Now, the risk assessment, we'll look at it. I have a sample page of it for you. It's a CDPH form. It tells you just how careful you need to be. But if you're gonna think about using enhanced standard precautions, there's some trust here. We have to trust you as the healthcare workers going in and out of the room will follow these rules pretty closely. So we found that um, staff going into a contact isolation room would say, well, I'm just going to peek my head in the door and see if she's awake or asleep. I'm not gonna to touch anything. Well, with contact isolation, you still have to gown and glove to go into that room. With enhanced standard precautions, if you're just walking into that room and the patient has an MDRO in their wound, if your hands are in your pockets or behind your back, or you've crossed your hands and you promise not to touch anything, brush up against anything, then you wouldn't need anything with enhanced standard precautions. But I want you to stop and think, how many times have you walked into a room just to look and ended up adjusting a pillow or boosting a patient or moving the bedding to check the Foley bag or check the positioning? Okay, now that's where we need to know that you know what to do, <coughs> excuse me, and when to do it, and that's the trust piece. Um, just curious, for any of you in the group, have you ever worked at a facility that has officially adopted enhanced standard precautions and are using it? Have you ever followed that? Not every facility does, but if you start having <clears throat> these MDROs, it's something to think about. And that's why Claudine, uh, we talked about this. 
should we introduce that? And we decided we probably should because you're having enough of these bugs. So here's a comparison of your choices. Everybody gets standard precautions, right? That's your standard or universal. Um, if, it, if it's needed, it's all blood and moist body fluids, um, unsuspected infectious agents. You, should, you would always wear gloves to empty a Foley catheter. You would always wear a gown um, to change um, the bedding or clothing or diaper of a person with diarrhea, correct? You would automatically do that. Um, you're going to have diarrhea, you're probably going to put them on C. diff precautions. Enhanced standard allows you to have a little bit more of a choice. Sometimes that patient can even leave the room with enhanced standard precautions if that infection is contained, but that's your risk factor assessment. You're going to decide, are they colonized? Are they infected? How likely are they to share that bug? With enhanced standard, you do your resident assessment. You're always going to do hand and hygiene. If you're wearing PPE, it's going to be done and doffed in the room. But there are, it's around specific activities. We'll look at that a little bit more. And some residents with an MDRO might actually be able to leave their room and go to a presentation, um, go to a group activity. Um, if their bug can be contained. That's the risk assessment. Whereas if you go in transmission-based contact precautions, they're in their room um, and they're in a single room or they're cohorted with some of the exact same infection. Um, and that is um, strict precautions, gown and glove um, for every entry into the room. So you've got three choices there of the level of precautions that you wanna use. If you want to use enhanced standard precautions, and this will have to be improved, approved by your infection prevention team at your facility before you go to this, you're going to use many of the same tools, hand hygiene, PPE, face protection if there's a splash, and really good environmental cleaning. Um, those are the same elements that you need for regular precautions as well. For enhanced standard precautions, there are six moments when you're going to be using your full PPE. If it's just to step into the room to take a peek, is she awake, is she asleep, you wouldn't. But if you're doing your morning care, your mouth care, uh, peri care, uh, dressing, your toileting or changing incontinence briefs, um, those are two moments for enhanced standard precautions. That means you're going to gown and glove for those if they're at high risk. Caring for devices. So that includes your foleys, your trachs, or giving a medical treatment. Um, wound care, mobility assistance, getting them up and about, or cleaning their room. That's going to involve wearing full precautions. So hand hygiene, gowns, and gloves for each of those six moments hand hygiene always, and then remove your PPE and hand hygiene in the room when that activity is complete. We'll talk a little bit more about the six moments. But first we have to decide, can we do it? So let's look at that risk assessment. This is the CDPH risk assessment for enhanced standard precautions. If your patient has a MDRO that we know is one of these dangerous ones, um, you have to decide, are they high risk? So if they have any of these things, totally dependent on others for these, um, ambulating, using a wheelchair, dressing, bathing, grooming, eating, and toileting, they have a functional um, disability, they're high risk. Are they incontinence, habitual soiling, not just occasional? Do they have a device, a catheter, a feeding tube, a trach, or a PIC, vascular catheter, or a port, something like that? they're ventilator dependent, and they have a wound or pressure ulcer unhealed, that makes them high risk. Um, so high risk, you can, um, during that high risk period, because some people may go back and forth between at risk and high risk, um, then you're going to need your full contact precautions if they have a producer. But if it's non-producing, you may still be able to bring them out of the room and use your enhanced standard precautions. The producers are going to require full. Um, and the, this form helps you, shows that you decided, do we have a roommate appropriate for this person? That's a tricky thing. CDPH is going to want you to be doing this risk assessment if you decide you want to use enhanced standard precautions. So room placement, what do you do with the room? Well, if you have an MDRO, we always like a single room, right? That's the wishful thinking piece. We don't always have a single room, but we would love it if we did. 
Um, prioritize your single bed rooms for the highly resistant or unusual MDROs. Those are your producers. Unless you happen to have two producers with the same bug, then you could go to the double room. That's cohorting like conditions, compatible roommates, you know, male, female, personalities, et cetera. Lots of ways to be compatible. Um, but this is where your producers fall. That's the highly resistant or unusual. If you do cohort, each bed space is a, considered as if it was a different room. Um, and some examples of that would be um, the CRE, Candida, the CRPA, the CRAB. Um, if you have ongoing transmission, that means it's happening in your facility. You admitted a CRPA, two weeks later, you have another one on the same hall or a roommate. Now you have ongoing transmission and that's gonna change things. Okay, now you're going back to um, isolating. We'll talk about that a little bit more too. So newly emergent or pan resistant, single room if you can, but when you know it, cohort with the same MDRO. So when you contact us, this happens frequently, Capsid gets a question, we've got these two patients, here's their cultures, can we cohort them? They need to be the same bug with a very similar resistance or susceptibility panel and not multiple bugs. If push comes to shove and you're totally stressed for space, and you promise to be very careful and treat each bed space as a single room, you can on occasion cohort. We suggest when that happens that you talk to CDPH and let them know and get their permission basically to do this because they won't want to find that out as a surprise. If you do use a multi-bedroom, it's key that you treat each resident space as a separate room, you will change PPE and use hand hygiene as you go from patient A to patient B because all these places and more in patient A's environment are contaminated and can easily get on your gloves and your gown. And how easy is it to walk to the next patient? You would also want to think about how your room is set up. Have you maximized the distance between those patients to make it easier to do that? It's tricky. It can be done, but it's tricky. Um, failure to perform hand hygiene between the contacts uh, will result in resident transmission of these germs. So that's a, a tricky thing to do. Um, you have to be very cautious. I used the word trust earlier. If you start cohorting um, these MDROs, we're going to trust you to know what to do and when and how. Um, sometimes we get questions about accepting a new resident or a resident is coming back to you with a new diagnosis of one of these MDROs. Um, CDPH doesn't consider it a reason to deny admission um, as long as the facility can provide the needed supportive and restorative care. Some of these MDRO patients, especially the producers, are likely to need a private room unless you have a perfect match for a roommate and if you don't have that, then you may be forced to deny that admission. That's a possibility. Um, so communicate why we do this, how we do that. And we are doing this now and giving you instructions for your healthcare providers. There's more instruction we can give you on that if needed. This is a flyer um, and the link is, is found on the um, CDPH Hospital Acquired Infection website. It's a brochure, a double printed brochure. And I think it's great. This is page one. It has those six moments and it's for residents and families and it explains enhanced standard precautions. So if your family member wants to come in and um, participate in the care of their family member with one of these MDROs, we want them to use a gown and glove if they are helping with a tube feeding or helping with changing incontinence briefs, depends on what's going on with that patient. We need the families to participate in that as well. Um, so families and visitors, how they can help is key. So this education piece for them is useful. Um, you can get a better printout of this flyer from the website. I just want to show it to you as a sample. It explains what staff do and how they do it, wearing gloves and gowns for contact with residents, infective cleaning, and who is managed, which, this is your risk assessment, which patients get that? Do they have a device, a ventilator, are they completely dependent? And when do we do it? And these are your six moments. So that brochure summarizes it very nicely in two pages. 
Um, and that's useful for you as well as for your families and your residents that say, what, what is this? Two-page brochure available from CDPH. Another really useful tool, and this is my last slide before we open it up for questions, um, CDPH, and actually most states have something similar. Um, and by the way, Dr. Sefo, Massachusetts has a really nice MDRO toolkit. Um, I really like theirs. Um, but California has a good one too. This is just the three that we talked about today briefly, CRAB, CRE, and CRPA. But these are links to PDFs of all of the information that you need to manage these patients. The quick sheets are nice. They're about two pages. Um, they're also useful to print and hand to a family member um, or for staff to review. And it tells you how to decide how to place this patient, what to do with them. The carbapenemase testing, hopefully your lab is going to do. And then there's a simpler version for patients and families. And they have it for each of these bugs. They're, it's out there for um, the Candida auris and for C. diff as well. But these are the three that we're focusing on today. So that's why I put the links in there for that. And that actually is the page that they're on. But um, really good information in that toolkit. And the uh, California page that talks about enhanced standard precautions, which I have referenced elsewhere, um, has some good decision-making um, pieces there. So I will stop the screen share and open it up for questions from you guys if you have anything you'd like to talk to us about. Anything new in there that you haven't heard before? Flyer, um, with them right now. I printed them out the flyer. Okay, great. Then, yeah, we have a copy of it right now. Good. Did y'all know Claudine has a post test? <laughs> there will be a test. <laughs> it's not a hard one, but there will be a test. <laughs> Sometimes tests make you think twice and go back and look at the question again. You have had CRPA and CRE, but I don't think you've had CRAB yet. Have you at your facility? Um, someone has a question right now. Okay. Oh, um, so. They wanted to know what board science the CDPH recommends for the residents, the board science. Ah, okay, that was one of your questions, right. <laughs> Do you see the number six? Okay. I'll go back and show you the, the answer to that. Okay, this is the door sign. The six moments for enhanced standard precautions. Now, you don't have to use the CDPH door sign, but this is the door sign that they recommend. CDPH likes this with the six moments right on there. It doesn't say what the bug is. There's no HIPAA violation. It's just a reminder to you before you do any of these activities, you need to do hand hygiene, gown, and glove. So you'll see that stepping into the room to see if a patient is asleep or awake is not on there. You don't need to gown and glove for that. But anything that involves contact with that patient or their environment, then you need a gown and glove. So that this actually is the door sign right there. Claudine, could you relay that question so uh, we can hear uh, better? You wanna? Yeah, like for the seniors from the patient. <laughs> <laughs> this is honey. 
Uh, yeah, for the city patients, before to determine them to be out of isolation is to check if they're still having loose DM or not. If they're having loose stools, they remain in isolation. Yeah. You cannot discontinue the isolation until the stools have resolved. Okay. Mm -hmm. but we have that this patient, that some, we have like one or two patients that became, became positive, but they're not having no skin. Okay. Antibiotic, so we don't know how can we determine that they're going to be out of isolation. Because sometimes the medicine, the vancomycin is given like more than a month. So what is the basis for that that we're going to be out of isolation? Okay, we, we don't ever want to do a C. diff test on a person that is not actively having diarrhea. We don't want to do a test on them. We know about that. They still show as positive. Yeah, the problem is sometimes the doctor, because you want to know what's the reason the patient is having a high WBC. This is the current one. The patient is having high WBC, so even though they're not having loose DM, they're like trying to get, you know, the answer to the problem. So now the patient is having this positive CD without no symptoms of having loose DM. So, yeah, they should not have done that C. diff test, yeah. as Marianne was saying. It's hard, it's hard to yeah. get them not so, to do it, but you can, you can send a message. To, uh, to one of us, and then you know, we can always try to intervene with the doctor who ordered the test before you collect the stool. But the lab also shouldn't perform the, the, the stool. The lab doesn't, I mean, the stool disintegrates by the time they get it, you know, if it's sent out. So they don't really know. But the, the, if the stool, if it's formed, really shouldn't, shouldn't be sent for C. diff. The, the high white count is not coming from the... Uh, from C. diff in that case. So, so how can we determine if they're going to be out of isolation or something? I mean, the patient... So well, once, it, once the patient's been treated for, started on treatment for C. diff, I, I think it's 10 days, right? Even while they're on the treatment. The, the way you order it, it's like... Because um, so sometimes they try to get them off. They take for the, 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 the vancomycin. So vancomycin, like from four times a day, times a day, four times a day, times 10 days, times a day for, for uh, like, you know, times 10 days, then twice a day, then I, I, I think, I think, I think we're talking about two different things. I think we're talking about the vancomycin taper for a patient with real C. diff, okay? Uh -huh. uh, and uh, we're, we're talking about a, uh, so, so, so that's, that's one uh, issue and that's reasonable. Uh, uh, you know, vancomycin taper for what is real um, uh, C. diff, and you would stop the isolation uh, at a minimum of 10 days after treatment started, or as long as they're having uh, formed BMs, uh, right? So, uh, and then if you're talking about so, so that's for the people that are on the taper. So they don't need to be in isolation for the whole time. They're on the taper just until uh, a minimum of 10 days or the stool is firm. That's what I like to do, at least. That was a great question. Anything else, Claudine? I think um, we're still thinking about the questions, um, but if we have any more questions, I can just send you that question. Maybe they're still brewing it. Um, last call for questions. I think we're good, Marianne and Dr. Okay. Well, hopefully we covered the topics that you were hoping to see. We tried to keep it brief because I know you're probably at your change of shift right now, correct? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again, everyone there for taking the time and for all the hard work that you're doing. Your job is not an easy one. Um, thank you for all the good work that you do.
And we're here to support you in any way we can. Don't hesitate to contact us if you need us. Thank you. Bye. Take care.